Should we care about inequality? The Bank of England has halved its forecast for average wage growth. The bank now expects average salaries to rise by 1.25% this year. The forecast comes as official figures showed average wages, excluding bonuses, grew by just 0.6%. Wages in the UK are falling while employment is rising. That's not normal, is it? It's not at all normal, no. And we thought there was a period in the depths of the recession where we thought, you know, it makes sense that wages have fallen a lot because unemployment's gone up and therefore there are an awful lot of people looking for jobs. And that means that the kind of price that they're willing to work at has fallen. But what we've seen since the start of the recovery is that employment has torn ahead. People are finding jobs left, right and centre. And yet wages just remain persistently weak. So by now, almost everyone thought that we would start to see wage growth pick up again. But no, so far, if anything, it looks like it's getting worse. In the United States, David Leonard of the New York Times calls the great wage slowdown of the 21st century. He notes that wages and incomes have been going virtually nowhere in the U.S. for the last 15 years, pointing out that the typical American household makes no more than the typical household did in the final years of the 20th century. We haven't seen anything like that since perhaps the Great Depression. The number of billionaires in the world has more than doubled since the global financial crisis. Which showed us that the problem has gotten dramatically worse in just the last four years. In 2010, Oxfam said, the 80 wealthiest people in the world were worth $1.3 trillion, while the poorest half of the world had $2.6 trillion. In 2014, the 80 richest had $1.9 trillion, up 47%, while the poorest half had just $1.8 trillion, a decrease of 29%. Oxfam showed that in 2010, the wealthiest 1% of the population enjoyed 44% of the world's wealth, while the remaining 99% of the world's population had only 56% of the pie. By 2014, the richest 1% had 48% of global wealth, leaving the rest with 52%. If that trend continues, the top 1% will own half the world's wealth in 2016 and 54% of global wealth in 2020, leaving the rest with just 46%. The world over, 80 billionaires in 2014 had about the same amount of wealth as the poorest 3.5% billion people, Oxfam said. Far from quelling the ranks of the super-rich, the 2008 markets crash has in fact swelled the ranks of billionaires to 1,645 people. Seven out of ten people live in countries where the gap between rich and poor is greater than it was 30 years ago. The report said that in countries in all four corners of the globe, a wealthy minority are taking an ever-increasing share of their nation's income. Well, particularly actually over the last 30 years, the, the gap between rich and poor has really exploded. Um, but what's interesting is that um, Credit Suisse put out some, um, some data showing what's happened since the financial crisis in terms of the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest. And they showed that the inequality, so that gap was kind of starting to narrow a little bit before the financial crisis. And since, it's, since then, since 2009, it started to open up again. So it's showing that the richest have made a recovery. They're doing well again. The number of billionaires has actually doubled, more than doubled since the financial crisis. And you've still got one billion people living in extreme poverty. Um, and that's the kind of situation that we think is unacceptable. At the start of 2014, Oxfam calculated that the richest 85 people on the planet owned as much as the poorest half of humanity. The charity said that between March 2013 and March 2014, these 85 people grew 668 million US dollars richer each day. Extreme wealth is not just to be found in richer nations. The very, very rich exist alongside desperate poverty in many countries. The world's richest man is Mexico's Carlos Slim, who knocked Bill Gates off the top spot in July 2014. Today, there are 16 billionaires in sub-Saharan Africa, alongside the 358 million people living in extreme poverty. The report also predicts that the sheer number of billionaires and their combined wealth has risen so rapidly that this year alone a tax of 1.5% could fill the annual gaps in funding needed to get every child into school and deliver health services in those poorest countries. We think the tax system has got out of control. It's not fair anymore. So it's not fair that in countries from Nicaragua to Spain that you see some of the wealthiest paying lower taxes as a proportion of what they own than ordinary people like us. We think that that's got out of perspective and needs to be rebalanced. Does that mean that the wealthiest are gonna to have to pay more? Yes, it absolutely does. 
but it's really not a massive amount of money we would need in order to solve some of the world's biggest problems. Oxfam is far from arguing the benefits of a communist economic system, acknowledging that some inequality is necessary to reward talent and promote innovation and entrepreneurship. It says though that the current extremes of inequality are actually undermining growth and progress by failing to invest in large portions of society. Oxfam believes that the extreme economic inequality which has exploded across the world in the last 30 years is one of the biggest economic, social and political challenges of our time. But we must accept that there are disagreements over the best way to measure inequality. Is it best to look at income or wealth, today or over time? But while the measures may be different, the conclusions are the same. To make things simple, let's imagine the population of the UK as a group of 100 people, each person representing 1% of UK households. Some of these people might live alone, others as a couple, some might have children, others might be teachers, nurses, footballers, plumbers, accountants, even celebrities. Now let's line these people up from the poorest to the richest. Let's colour code the bottom fifth, the top fifth and those in the middle. And let's take the total household income of the UK, that's around £900 billion, and imagine it's £1,000 coins. Based on the latest data for the year 2012, once taxes have been paid, benefits added and adjustments made for whether people live alone or part of a family, this is how income is divided. This is the actual inequality of household income in the UK. The poorest person doesn't even receive half a coin, not even 50 pence. The bottom 18 people, the lowest 18% of households, have less than five pounds. The person in the middle, the 50th person, has eight coins. The person three quarters the way along, the 75th person, has 11 and a half coins. And the person at the top receives almost 80 pounds. In other words, even after tax, the household at the top takes home around 150 times more than the poorest household and 50 times more than the second poorest. But of course, looking at how much households earn in one year is not the only way to look at how rich or poor people are. What about wealth? Income is the flow of money, wealth is the stock of capital, assets, which includes money, and liabilities. For most people in the UK, the two biggest assets and liabilities are their house and their pension. So let's imagine a street with 10 houses. The first house represents the poorest 10% of households in the UK, all the way up to the 10th house, which represents the wealthiest 10% of households. We can now show how the UK's wealth of around £10 trillion is shared. Now some households don't own their own house, so the money they owe on their mortgage is actually more than the assets they own. Their wealth is either zero or negative. Some of these people with negative wealth might have a high income. This is a problem when looking at wealth rather than income. But let's focus on the wealthiest houses on the street. Between the top two houses, there are 636 coins. In other words, the top 20% of households in the UK hold 63% of the wealth. But if we divide up the top house into 10, we see that there is one house off the chart. In the top 1% of households, there are 130 coins, or 13% of the country's wealth. Compare this allocation with the allocation of income. And we see that when we look at wealth, the difference between the richest and the poorest is much larger. The biggest problem with taking a snapshot, however, is that inequality changes over time. The best data we have is for income. We start the graph in 1961 and move forward through each decade. We can see that inequality is clearly on the rise. And remember, this is inequality after taxes and benefits. So inequality is higher than we think it should be, and it is higher than it was in the 1960s. But still, many people would accept more inequality today if it meant that more people stand a chance of getting to the top. It's our good fortune that we have data on social mobility as well. Let's go back to 1958. Let's take a couple from the bottom quarter of all earners and let's assume they have a child. At birth, what are the chances of that child born in 1958 ending up in the top quarter by the time they're in their early 30s? Well, by 1991, 17% of the top earners in society came from families at the bottom. By comparison, over one-third, that's 34% of top earners, came from families in the top quarter. If we take a child from 1970 in the bottom quarter of earners, at birth, what are the chances of that child born 
ending up in the top 25% by the time they reach 30. By 2000, 13% of people in the top quarter were born at the bottom, down from 17% in 1991. By comparison, the proportion of people in the top quarter whose parents were also in the top quarter had risen from 34% to 42%. So not only is there rising inequality of outcomes, there is rising inequality of opportunity as well. There is one final way of looking at what has happened to inequality and that is by looking at individual earnings rather than households. We can compare the earnings of a person 10 from the top to a person 10 from the bottom. In 1970, the person 10 from the top earned 2.5 times more than person 10 from the bottom. This stayed roughly the same throughout the 1970s, but changed dramatically in the 1980s. And by 2010, the difference was 50% larger. This is not to say that life hasn't improved in other ways, but on the issue of inequality, all our measures show that the difference between the richest and the poorest in the UK is getting larger. For many people, this is a price worth paying if it means we are living in a country where people have the opportunities to climb up the social ladder. But there are two things happening. Firstly, the rungs on the ladder are getting further apart. And secondly, fewer people are climbing them. It's interesting to note that income inequality varies widely among rich countries. A report this month from the Center for American Progress compared the middle class and nations around the world. The bottom 90% of earners in Canada, for example, averaged over 1% annual income growth in the 2000s. In Australia, they averaged 2.5%. But in the U.S., their average annual income declined by 1% over that time. So it seems like something can be done about income inequality. How about taxing the super rich? That's one possibility, though the top 20% already pay 69% of federal taxes in America according to the CBO. The key is to make major investments to help push people up the economic ladder. And that's something that other countries in Northern Europe and Canada, for example, are doing much better as free community college and improved access to childcare are on the right track. Expanded preschool, nutritional assistance, and other early interventions, all are effective in helping get people out of poverty. So the cost of this but are the risks around allowing inequality to continue in the way it is and allowing this gap to continue growing are hugely significant and they are going to have massive political downsides as well. So if you look at the evidence, actually high inequality is bad for the economy, so it, it stops growth and it means that growth is, is not as long lasting and not as strong. This is, this is a huge, um, huge issue if, that's to get out, if that gets more out of control. More unequal countries are ones where crime rates are higher, um, violence, com violent conflict is higher. These are problems that affect everybody and problems that governments will have to take seriously. The charity Oxfam is demanding governments and global bodies take action to implement changes to reverse the spiralling trend. Among its demands are the closure of international tax loopholes to more fairly share the tax burden, increase minimum wages to move towards a highest to median wage ratio of 20 to 1, and to provide affordable or free health and education to all. Rising inequality not only affects us today, but long into the future. If we don't act now and the gap keeps widening, soon someone will start suggesting some very radical solutions. <laughs>